Good morning, explorers. Welcome to another day of Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Sarah. I work in the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And we're so happy you are joining us this morning. We are going to talk about one of my favorite topics. My favorite things to talk about are tide pools. Now you might recognize some of the animals back here. These are tide pool animals, and this is here at the aquarium. But we're gonna explore what this habitat is, what a tide pool is, and then we're gonna take a look at some of the animals who we find in this habitat. We're just adjusting our camera a little bit. Moved around a little. Excellent. So like I said, we're gonna talk about what a tide pool is, and then we're gonna look at some of the animals who live in a tide pool, and we're gonna talk about what makes them special, what special things they have on their body that help them survive in the tide pool. Because as we'll talk about, a tide pool is a really unique habitat. Now, as we're exploring, if you have questions, if you wanna share your observations, we'd love to hear from you. And we just put a number up. I have two friends with me in the studio. I have Miss Alicia, who's controlling what you see behind me, and she just put up this number. And then I have Miss Carrie, who's gonna be at our computer, and she'll take those questions and observations and send them in to me. So you can text us in at 562 286-1838. And that's if you're watching live. Now, if you're watching after the fact, and we're not live anymore, we still want to hear your questions and be able to answer them. We just ask you to use this email address that's just below, right here, live at lbaop.org. All right, explorers, are you ready to get started? Excellent. So I mentioned we're going to talk about a tide pool. So I'm going to have us bring up a picture of what a tide pool looks like. Let's take a look at what a tide pool is. So these are some animals you might see, <coughs> excuse me, but we're gonna look at what this habitat is. Now think about that word, habitat. Have you heard that word before? Excellent, I'm gonna step off the screen. But have you heard that word before, habitat? I know that we talk a lot about habitats here in our program. So you may have heard us talk about it or you may have learned about it outside of our programs. But a habitat is where an animal lives. It's their home. It's everything that makes up where they live. So it could be non-living things, and it could be some living things as well. So take a look at this picture of a tide pool. What do you notice? Let's make some observations together. Now here in Southern California, we have a lot of tide pools. They're found right along our coast where the beach is kind of rocky. And you can see in this picture, there are lots of rocks. But what else do we notice? I'm gonna have Alicia put up that phone number again, just so you have it in case you want to send us in. But let's take a look. So I noticed some rocks. What else do we notice? I also see there's a lot of water, right? So here's the open ocean, but then even right here along the rocks, there's lots of water and there's some waves right here. So that's really important for a tide pool is this water movement. That's what the word tide has to do with. It's the movement of the water going in and out. Now we have two high tides a day and two low tides a day. So that's where the water rises really high and where the water goes pretty low. Now, if we look at this picture, would you think that this is a picture of high tide or low tide? So think about water is really high versus water is really low. What do you think, high tide or low tide? There are some clues in this photo that tell us if it's high tide or low tide. So if you all said that you think this is low tide, you are absolutely correct. And that's because all this rock work here is all exposed and the beach is exposed. So the water has moved back out and some of that water has gotten caught in all these spaces in the rocks. And those are the pools, part of that tide pool. But if this were high tide, all of that rock would be completely covered. Now you can see right here along the beach how the sand looks kind of wet. So we know that at one point that water did completely cover all the rocks and sand. But now that it's low tide, the water has receded or it's gone back out. And we have exposed the rocks and all those pools. And if we were to dive in closer to look in those pools, we would find a lot of animals. So that is what makes up a tide pool. Now I see we have some questions coming in already. Excellent, so we will get to those questions. So our tide pool is a really interesting habitat. So it's right along the coast where there's a lot of rocks and those waves come in and out and it leaves those pools of water for a lot of smaller animals to live. Now that we know what a tide pool is, let's dive in to talk about some animals. But what I want us to think about with each animal we talk about Oh, here's another good look at a tide pool. So what's really neat about a tide pool is they're very easy for us to go explore. So like I was saying, we have a lot of tide pools right here along our coast, and they usually have beach access, so you can walk right onto these rocks and explore the tide pools. 
Now you do want to be careful. It can be kind of slippery sometimes. Uh, and you want to make sure that the tide is low and not high when you're going to explore. But it's a really fun way to see animals out in their natural habitat and explore a really cool habitat. So now talking about animals, what I want to think about today as we're exploring different animals who live in the tide pools is I want to focus on their adaptations. Now that word, adaptation, it's a big word and I see it used in one of our questions even. But what is an adaptation? Let's think if we've heard that word before. Adaptation. It's another word we talk about a lot in our programs here. An adaptation is something on an animal's body that helps it survive in its habitat. So animals in the tide pool, they have really special adaptations, really special tools or things on their body or behaviors that help them survive in this habitat. Because there's a lot of challenges to every habitat where an animal lives, and there's definitely some challenges to living in the tide pools. And one of those big challenges we looked at before are those waves. So we wanna think about what things on these animals' body help them survive in a place where maybe the water's level changes or where there's a lot of wave action or even where there's people around. What things do these animals have on their body to survive? Oh, and we even got a question, how do animals survive the crashing waves? Excellent. Well, I want you to think about that. So I know you asked me, but I'm going to pose it to you. How do you think these animals survive the crashing waves? And we're going to look at some animals and we'll see some of them have similar ways and some have different ways that allow them to survive being hit by those waves all the time. All right. So I'm going to go to some of the questions because it brings up some animals and we can take a look at these animals who live in a tide pool. So one question is, how can octopus and eels live in a tide pool? Great question. So let's see if we can take a look at an octopus. Ah, excellent. Now this is an octopus you might find in a tide pool. It's called a two spot octopus. And that's because it's got two spots on its body, one right here. And then the other one's on the other side of its body we can't really see. But they are a two spot octopus and we will find them living here in the tide pools. Now what do you notice about this octopus's body? Octopus are very cool animals and they have a lot of really unique adaptations. And some of the adaptations that help them live in the tide pool are displayed right here. So what do you notice? Take a look at the color of this octopus. Does it look similar to any other color you see in this image? Yeah, it blends in with its surroundings. So camouflage. So camouflage is one way that animals can survive in so many different habitats, but definitely in the tide pools. So the octopus, here we go, here's another picture of an octopus. Those octopus can camouflage into their surroundings, whether it's rocks or if it's more kind of mossy or algae, if there's any greens around them, they can camouflage. They can even change the texture. So not only the color, but also the texture of their body. And that way they can blend into if it's kind of more rocky, if it's more sandy, if there's bumpy or smooth, they can change the texture of their body to blend in. And then if there's a shallow pool in the tide pool, if they blend in, it's gonna be harder for predators to find them. So that is one adaptation that an octopus might use to live in the tide pool. And then someone was asking about eels living in a tide pool too. Excellent. Well. Most eels you're gonna find in the lower tidal zone if we're gonna find them in the tide pools. So a tide pool, we've got all these rocks, but there's different zones. So if you walk right onto the beach and you see the rocks, that's gonna be the upper tidal zone, right? It's sort of towards the surface, towards sea level where we are. But as you go deeper in or farther out to sea, it's gonna get deeper and deeper and there can still be tide pools a little bit deeper. And so we might find eels like this California moray eel a little bit deeper in larger pools as part of the tide pool. And that's because this is a larger animal. And so it's gonna need a little bit more space than just hanging out in those shallow pools where the octopus and some of the animals might be. And then another question following that octopus and eel question is what adaptations let them do that or let them live in these tide pools? So there are so many. So camouflage is one of those. Having the right kind of space or knowing where to be and what kind of depth and water they need, that could be an adaptation, kind of knowing their surroundings. So there's lots of adaptations these animals can have. Now back to the octopus, we talked about camouflage, but there's an, another adaptation that we can see really well on this octopus here. And it's actually an adaptation that a lot of animals use in the tide pools because it does save them from those crashing waves, that question you asked about before. Does anyone know what this octopus has all along its arms? So it's all these little things here, and then here, and then over here, and over here, and here, and here, they have them all over. Does anyone know what those are? I'm gonna give you all a minute because I bet someone out there who's watching knows what this octopus uses to hold on living in the tide pool. So think about it. that's another adaptation and there's a bunch of animals who use that. So while you're thinking about that adaptation, 
I'm going to go on to some of our other questions. All right, Ms. Amador's class. Hi, Ms. Amador's class. Thanks so much for joining us again. Ms. Amador's class asks, what animals live in a tide pool? Excellent. So we've already covered two of them, but look at all these animals. So tide pools, they might be really small spaces, but they can be very biodiverse, which means they can have a lot of animals living in even one pool altogether. So check out, this is here at our aquarium, and let's see how many animals we can count. We've got sea stars, right? There's one kind of sea star here. This is called a bat star. And then we've got another star here. It's called an ochre star, and that's the same as this one right here with sort of those tiny white little dots on their body. And then we've got even another kind of sea star over here. And this one has a couple different names. I grew up calling it a knobby star or a jeweled star, but it can also be called a giant spined star. So we've got at least three types of sea stars in here. What other animals do we notice? We've got this thing right here. Oh, right there. A sea anemone. And there's a sea anemone right here and right here and right here and right here. So lots of sea anemones. So we've got sea stars and sea anemones. Any other animals? Oh, I noticed one right here. Oh, a sea urchin. So that spiny animal right there is a sea urchin. And then even up here is an animal. One of my favorite tide pool animals. It's a sea cucumber. So there's so many animals, and there's even more than we have in this picture that live in a tide pool. And we also added eel and octopus to them. Oh, and you know what? I spotted another one down here. This right here that looks kind of like a rock is actually a snail. So there's also types of sea snails who live in the tide pools. So, so many animals. Now, another question from Ms. Amador's class is, is it okay to touch the animals when you visit the aquarium? Oh, absolutely. Now, I do have to say, unfortunately, our tide pool that you see here, that touch pool is not open to touching, but we have a lot of other animals for you to touch. So if you come visit the aquarium, you can touch moon jellies, you can touch sharks, you can touch stingrays, you can... I think that's all our touch pools. Horseshoe crabs. So we have a lot of animals to touch. Unfortunately, our tide pool animals are just for looking right now. But it's still pretty cool to see them. But what's neat about these animals is you don't even need to visit an aquarium to touch some of these animals. If you visit a tide pool area and you go out and explore, you can touch the animals in their natural habitat. Now, when we go out to the tide pools, we do want to make sure we leave the animals where they are. And we're gentle when we're touching. But... What's neat is all these animals are safe for us to touch if you do see them out in our local tide pools. So that's pretty cool. All right, let's see what other questions we have. Ah, so, a, oh, so a question came in ooh, from Clifton Park in New York. Thank you for watching all the way in New York. And you know, I just kind of covered this, but I'll cover it again. So the question is, why is it okay to touch animals in the touch tank at the local aquarium? <clears throat> but not in the real tide pools. That is a good question. Now, I did just say that you could go out to a local tide pool and you can touch the animals. One of the biggest things, there's sort of two big things we want to keep in mind. One is you want to make sure you know what it is you're touching. If you are live in a local area and you go out to the tide pool and you are familiar with the animals or you go with someone who maybe is familiar, like someone who works in an aquarium and knows these animals and knows that they are safe to touch, then you can touch them gently. You want to make sure you're knowing what you're touching because there could be some animals that may not like to be touched and their defenses could be harmful to you. And so you want to make sure that you are not harming the animals and you aren't being harmed. The other thing is you want to make sure that we are not disturbing these animals in any way. So while they're safe to touch here at the aquarium, it's in a regulated area and you have an instructor letting you know. When you go out into the wild, you just want to make sure that you are touching the right kind of animals. You're not disturbing anything and you're being safe and you're keeping the animals safe as well. So I wouldn't say it's never okay to touch our tide pool animals out in the wild, but you just want to be a little bit more informed about the animals that you're touching and the areas you're touching to make sure that you stay safe and you keep our animals safe. But that is a good question. And you, there are lots of local resources wherever you are uh, to help you understand what sort of rules there are in place when you're touching animals or going out and exploring natural habitats. All right, let's see, we've got another question. If you find a hermit crab without a shell, should you try to find an empty shell to give it? That is such a sweet question. I love that idea, is helping these animals. But you know what, these animals, they are ready to find their own shells. They're trained to do these things for their survival. And so if you give them a shell, you may be giving them someone else's shell. It may not fit. And so we can watch them 
and make sure that they're okay, but you want to make sure that they are working on their own because next time they're looking for a shell, they may not have anyone there to give them a shell. And so we want to make sure that while we are watching animals and it is safe to touch some animals, we don't want to disturb them in any way. We want to change what they're doing. We don't want to change around their habitat and we don't want to change the behaviors of those animals. Excellent questions. Now let's take a look at maybe another tide pool animal before we get to more questions that we have. So let's take a look, closer look at some sea stars because we have so many different types of sea stars here at the aquarium. So here is our coastal corner. This is where our touch pool is and you can see a lot of different sea stars in here. We've got some of those ochre stars, these ones with the little white polka dots. We've got a leather star right here. They often look pretty relaxed and laid back. We've got, I think this is a giant pink sea star right here, this pink one. So we have a lot of sea stars here in this exhibit. But let's talk about what are some adaptations that sea stars use to live in the tide pools. Thinking about those crashing waves. Ooh, this is a good image. They live in a place where they have to be on these rocks and there are waves crashing on them over and over and over again. What adaptations are they gonna use to hang on? Now this goes back to our octopus, they had the same adaptation as the octopus. Do we know what these are right here? All these little things, I think they kind of look like macaroni noodles, but these are all their feet of the sea star, but they're called suction cup feet. We call them tube feet, but they've got little suction cups on them. So think about a suction cup where it, something sticks onto it and then it's really hard to pull that thing off. That is what their feet are like. So sea stars and octopus have all these teeny tiny suction cups all along their feet. On each arm, they've got suction cups, suction cups, more suction cups, more suction cups. And they use all of those suction cups to stick onto, in this case, the glass of the exhibit, but out in the tide pool onto the rocks. And then if a wave hits them, they're really safe because those suction cups help hold them really tightly in place. Now those suction cup feet, they're not only used for that animals to hold on really tight. They serve a couple different purposes as well. So think about how do you think a sea star moves? Can they move? I mean, we don't see them moving too fast in here. And I often say that sea stars are some of the biggest slow pokes in the ocean, but they can move and they're going to use those suction cut feet. So they'll use them to hold on, but they'll also use them to move. So they'll lift one and then stick another and then stick and help them kind of move along. And we've got a really cool video close up. So this is our bat star, but take a look at all these little noodly feet and they're gonna stick on and they create a seal suction and then they can pull it off and that helps them move. So their suction cut feet help them stick onto things. They help them move. They also help them do one other thing, which might sound kind of surprising to you, but go ahead and touch your nose. Now we use our nose to breathe, but we also use it to do something else. We use it to smell things. So if you are in your room and someone else in your house is making cookies in the kitchen, how do you know they're making cook cookies? You might smell them and then you're going to run downstairs and go to the kitchen because you want to eat some cookies. So we use our nose to smell things, to smell food and other things. Our sea stars, they're going to smell for their food, but they don't have a nose like us. They're actually going to use those feet. So they use those suction cup feet to smell for their food. You heard that right. Now we don't smell with our feet, obviously. Your feet might be a little bit smelly sometimes, that happens, but we don't smell with our feet, but our sea stars, they use their feet, those suction cut feet, to smell for their food. Pretty cool, right? So that's another adaptation for our sea star. Now our sea star, they don't really have eyes that work very well like ours, so they can't look for their food. So instead they have this adaptation of being able to smell with their feet to find their food. Pretty cool, right? All right, we've got some more questions that came in. So Oscar wants to know, do sea otters visit tide pools to eat sea stars? Ooh, good question, Oscar. So look at this sea star. Look at this little sea star, this sea otter, this fuzzy little animal. So sea otters, they are known to eat sea stars. They're known to eat sea urchins, snails, a lot of animals who live in the tide pools. A lot of the tide pool animals also live in kelp forest habitats. So just beyond tide pools, we often find kelp forests. Not always, but here along our coast, that is the case. And otters are found in kelp forests like this. So this is sort of a lower tidal zone. So we've still got some rocks. We've got some wave action, definitely. But there's some bigger animals, some bigger anemones, some larger fish, some kelp growing. And this is where we might find sea otters living in the deeper water where there's still some of these animals that can be found in a tide pool 
also living deeper in the water. And that makes it a little bit easier access for our otters who aren't going to be leaving the water too much to find their food. All right, let's see what other questions we've got. Nick wants to know what plants live in a tide pool or do, they, or do only animals live there? Excellent question. So as we just mentioned, a little bit deeper than those upper tidal zones, we might find kelp, which is an algae. But even on those rocks, we find lots of mosses and sea grasses Eelgrass is one of them. Any kind of green algae, it's going to grow where it's wet, where there's water, sunlight, all these things can grow. So that's why when you go to the tide pools, you want to be really careful because it can be really slippery because there's all these greens and mosses and things growing on the rocks. And that provides a lot of food for animals. It provides us with oxygen. So it's really important to have a mix of both those animals and those plants in those tide pool habitats. All right. And what, oh, here we go. You can even see it here. Excellent. So take a look at the, down here. You notice all this sort of green growing. That is all of those algae and mosses and greens growing in that tide pool habitat. All right, so we have a question. What animals visit tide pools just to eat? Hmm, that is an interesting question. So think about this tide pool with these waves going in and out, and they're pretty shallow. So if you think about a larger ocean animal may not want to venture into a tide pool because they could get stuck. So there aren't going to be too many larger ocean animals who might visit a tide pool. We do have octopuses, which can be larger, and they will eat in a tide pool. We do find some fish sometimes, not too big, but depends on the depth of that pool. Some pools can be really shallow. Some can be a lot deeper. So the deeper, the more likely there's a larger predator. But there are some land animals who visit tide pools just to feed. Did you realize that? Kind of wouldn't think of that right off the top of your head, right? You think immediately an animal in the ocean is going to be feeding on the tide pool. But tide pool areas have a lot of other animals that come visit to feed at low tide. So there's some tide pools over in San Pedro. And I have seen foxes there. So there are some foxes that will come down at low tide. We have seen larger birds like seagulls and herons and egrets who come at low tide. There are raccoons and possums. So a lot of animals who live in these areas that are sort of near the tide pools, just on the shore side of it, so not out in the open ocean, but just on the shore side, they are gonna wait. They're what we call opportunistic feeders. So they're gonna wait for that opportunity when the tide is low to come on in and have a snack. So that's a good question because you're thinking there are some animals who might not live in this habitat, but they take advantage of this habitat because they take advantage of that low tide to get a nice tasty snack. All right, and then we have another question. Oh, and this will lead us into talking about another animal. So another question is, why is it safe to touch sea anemones? Excellent question. Let's take a look at a sea anemone. All right, so this right here is a sea anemone. And you are right in, in guessing or assuming that you can safely touch sea anemones. If you come to the aquarium, like I said, we are tide pool. Uh, touch tank is not open right now, but it has anemones that are safe to touch. And if you go out to the tide pools, you can safely touch these animals. Now, if you touch them, if anyone's touched them before, you might remember that they feel kind of sticky. So anemones are in a group of animals that are known for their stinging cells. You heard that right. They have stinging cells in their body. Now think about why might it be helpful for an animal to have stinging cells? Hmm. There's a couple reasons. And anemones use their stinging cells to protect themselves and to catch food. So if a fish might swim through, just like in here, if a fish might swim through their anemones, we've got a fish in here, but this fish knows not to go through those anemones. If a fish swims through those anemones' tentacles, they might get stung, and then the anemone can bring it into their mouth. Now, those stinging cells in those tentacles, they aren't strong enough to sting us humans because we have a lot of layers of skin on our fingers and their stinger just isn't that strong. But for a fish that maybe only has one thin layer of scales, they can feel that sting a lot more than we can. And that's why it's safe for us to touch these anemones. Now, when you touch it and it feels kind of sticky, almost like you're touching a piece of tape, that is that stinger firing. So it's a little cell in those tentacles. And sometimes, whenever something rubs against that cell or sort of disrupts that cell, they're going to fire that little stinger which is why even when we touch it, we, might, we don't feel a sting, we feel that stickiness. They're trying to sting us, they're trying to see, are you a predator, are you food? And then they decide that we're neither of those things. But that's why you feel that sticky feeling is because they're trying to sting us, but it is safe because like I said, our skin is too thick, it doesn't harm us at all. 
But those tentacles are really important. Ooh, here's a good picture of a tide pool. Those tentacles are really important for these animals. That is one of their adaptations living in this area is they can catch food as it's drifting by in those sticky tentacles. So in this picture, we've got a lot of other animals. So this is a picture taken out at a tide pool. And it almost looks kind of similar to the animals we saw in the tide pool that we have here at the aquarium. All these green things, these are all anemones. And they've kind of tucked in their tentacles. So they're not out and waving because they're not in the water. They don't really have a reason to have them out right now. So they've tucked them all in. We've got sea stars. Lots of anemones. All these things right here that are, look like they're covered in sand. That's our, those are actually anemones covering themselves in sand to hide. All right, more questions, but I love this. Nick asks, what can we do as people to help maintain tide pool habitats? Nick, that is such a great question. Now, there's a couple of things you can do. So think about this is a uh, habitat that's easy for us to access. And we've talked a lot about going and exploring this habitat. So one thing is just being aware of that habitat and being careful when you go out and explore it. You might get really excited and you start running on the rocks, but those animals could be living on the rocks. So just being careful where you step. Now, pollution is another big problem for tide pools because in a lot of areas, a lot of the drainage and sewage goes right into the tide pool habitat. It gets dumped right there. And if it's just some seawater from the rain, that's fine. But if it's got a lot of trash in it, that trash is gonna sit right in the tide pool, right in the home of these animals. And so pollution can be a big problem for these animals. So just making sure that you are picking up your trash, that you are recycling what you can, even that we are reducing some of the single use plastics and things that we have, everything we can reduce and make sure that we're throwing things away properly can help protect these tide pool habitats. That was a great question, Nick. Now, Yasmin wants to know, do sea stars like to live alone like octopus or do they live with other sea stars like friends and family? Well, take a look at this picture. What do you notice? I see a lot of sea stars. Let's see if we can bring up another image of a tide pool with some sea stars in it and see if we notice a lot of sea stars or just one. Look at this. We've got sea star, sea star, sea star, sea star. Now, sea stars, I don't think they're actually thinking, I want to live with my friends and family, as much as that would be really cool. But they just tend to be all in the same area, close proximity. And one of the reasons could be because of the way a tidal habitat is structured. These animals like to live in these lower tidals, or the uh, these lower or shallow pools, and there may not be a ton of those pools, there may not be a ton of space, and so they're all going to live close to each other. So while they're not choosing necessarily to live with their friends and family, we often find them in groups together. That is a great question. All right, Ricky wants to know, do sea anemones always live together in colonies, or do they live, I love these questions. It's really interesting to think about. So I know that these questions came in in our earlier program too about sea turtles. So our questions are, do sea turtles live alone or do they live together? Sea stars, sea anemones. There was even a question about octopus. And it really depends on the animal. Now, some animals, often mammals, so things like sea otters or humans, we spend a lot of time with our parents, right? With our mother and father, we learn from them. They help raise us. But a lot of smaller animals, especially in the invertebrate family, so animals with no backbone, like all the animals that we see here in this image, they don't tend to have very much parental care for their young. They lay a lot of eggs and then they basically let them go and hope that they survive and grow up to be adults to do the whole thing over again. But they all tend to be in this close proximity to each other. So they're not solitary like some animals, like octopus, like a lot of times like to live more solitary. They tend to be on their own. Animals in the tide pool, like the sea stars, the sea anemones, the sea urchins, we tend to see them in big groups. And that's because all their eggs are laid in one area and then they hatch and then they're already there. And then they might drift a little bit, but then all those eggs are gonna be laid and they're all gonna hatch and then they'll all live there. And in this one area is where there's gonna be a lot of food. And so these animals are also gonna go where there is food for them to eat. And so they all tend to be close to each other and not so solitary. All right, we are, have about a minute or so left. We have another question. Is it possible for the water to get so low at the low tide that animals get trapped and doesn't have enough water to live? Ooh, good thinking. So I like how you're thinking about how the water moves. Now, think about it. these animals, they live in this tide pool area. We talked about the sea stars, not a very fast moving animal. So if the water were to disappear completely, these animals can't just run really fast into deeper water or into another tide pool. So what they actually have 
goes back to adaptations. They have some special adaptations so that they can survive out of water for a period of time, sort of knowing that eventually high tide is going to come again. And so animals like these anemones that you see here, like I said, they pull in all their tentacles. Even these closed up ones, they also will hold water in their body. And holding water in their body allows them to survive out of the water for a period of time until the tide comes back. Now, if for whatever reason, a tide weren't to come back, there would be a limit to the time that they can spend out of water. And eventually it could be harmful if they don't get water in time. But for the most part, these animals have these special adaptations to basically hold water in their body so that they can survive out of water for a period of time. And then when the tide comes back in, then they're happily in the water again. All right, everyone, that flew by so fast. We are out of time talking about tide pools. I could go on and on. If you have more questions, go ahead and email us. We'll put that email address up again. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed learning about some of the animals in the tide pool, the ways they survive, especially with those crashing waves, and a little bit more about this local habitat to us here in Southern California. All right, everyone, I hope you have a good rest of your afternoon.